Right, well, welcome everybody. Um, excited to, to be here with all of you. My name is Rhett Sangster. I'm with the, uh, I work at the Office of the Treaty Commissioner in Saskatchewan, Canada. And uh, really excited to talk to you about some of the work we've been doing on uh, truth and reconciliation in, in, our, in our home province, in our territory. Um, I'm just gonna share my screen real quick. You see that okay? Yeah. Great. So we, um, I'm coming to you from Treaty Six territory uh, in uh, the province uh, now known as Saskatchewan in Canada. Um, and uh, in Canada, when we usually start our, our gatherings, we we usually like to recognize the ancestors uh, who have uh, been caretakers of this land for generations. And so I want to give thanks to the the, the Cree, the Dene. Uh, Soto, Lakota, Nakota, Dakota, and Métis nations who have uh, predecessed my, my own ancestors here. And, um, and we just recognize that that land is important and that land is here for us all to look after for the next seven generations. And so I wanted to, to start by, by thanking uh, those, those people. Um, we're going to talk to you today a little bit about um, the work that we've been doing in Canada, um, talking a little bit about why reconciliation is even a topic in Canada. Why are we, what, what is, what's the issue? Why are we talking about it? Um, we're going to do a little exercise where we ask you to think about what reconciliation, truth, truth and reconciliation looks like for you. Then we're going to talk a bit about some of the work we've been doing to pull people together and, uh, and start to set a common agenda and, um, talk about how we measure progress. And then we'll have some opening or some uh, group discussion at the end. But before we get started, um, again, one of the, the uh, types of work that we've been doing on reconciliation in Canada is we um, uh, learning from indigenous peoples, uh, we, we, like, we start with prayer. And so we start with uh, things in a good way and ask for the creator to, to guide our work. So without further ado, um, I've, Offer tobacco to uh, Judy Pelly, who's graciously uh, agreed to join us. So, uh, Judy, I'll ask you if you wouldn't mind to, to say a few words. Okay. And uh, again, I, I, I guess I, good morning. My name is Judy Pelly, and I come from 41st Nation in Saskatchewan, Canada. And I was, uh, uh, I'm a knowledge keeper in, in, uh, in primarily in Saskatoon. I work with the Health Authority and, and uh, do a lot of work with reconciliation with OTC as well as all the community-based organizations and universities and so on. But uh, uh, a lot of work has been done and I'm very proud that we're in Saskatchewan that we're doing so much, especially with the, with the, the we are being led with by the, the OTC, the Office of the Treaty Commissioner and doing some very good work provincially and uh, I was very happy to hear that uh, that we're doing per capita. We're doing we're one of the the, the most uh, that we're doing the most in TRC here in Saskatchewan. So I'm very very proud of our our, our uh, people, our indigenous peoples, our, the the community based organizations, universities, the uh, corporations, and so on. We're working together to do this very important work. So I, I'm in in Anishinaabe, who I'm a Soto, and and traditionally brought up in our, in, in uh, my territory and as well as as uh, with language and culture. So part of that is is when I when I say prayers and when we say prayers in Anishinaabe country, we don't use uh, any kind of media. We don't use any kind of uh, uh, we don't go on 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 camera to say our prayers. So I, I I've done that. I've, I've said my prayers uh, this morning. I, I smudged them. I prayed and. And I just, I'll just say in English what I, what I did pray for. I asked the creator to be with us and that we continue to work with our, uh, in, in specifically with our seven sacred teachings, which are some of which are love, respect, truth, uh, honor. I mean, uh, uh, some of, some of the, the, the wisdom and, and uh, also uh, courage. And I always say courage is very important to speak uh, the things that are very hard to sometimes talk about. We're challenged a lot of times to talk about uh, racism and, and uh, colonization and all, all, all that dark history. It's very tough to talk about, especially with the survivors. 
and I'm a residential school survivor. I attended my St. Philip's in, from 1970, I mean, from 1957 to 64. So, so I was, uh, I attended that St. Philip's Indian Residential School. So in my prayers, I also ask the creator to be with us as we, as we uh, go on with, uh, with this agenda and that we get the strength and uh, courage to see the, the, the things that we need to say in regards to our, the work in pre, uh, truth and reconciliation. And I, again, uh, I ask the creator to bless all your families, bless all of you, uh, wherever you are in the world and whoever uh, that, that uh, you're, Creator already knows, Creator God, uh, our higher power already knows what each and every one needs in our in our lives. So, so with that, uh, I, I just want to say that, of course, again, I, that I did smudge and pray, and, and your your my prayers have have been done uh, in my language and and in my home. So with that, Kimi uh, Guich, and thank you, and let's have a very good meeting, keeping our hearts and our minds open with love and love and honesty and, and um, again, courage to say the things that need to be said. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Judy, it's great. Next, we're gonna just introduce ourselves. So Commissioner, do you wanna start by introducing yourself? Sure. Anine, I'm coming to you today from Treaty One Territory in where Winnipeg, Manitoba now is. My name is Mary Culbertson. I'm from the Muscle family in Kizikis. I am Saskatchewan's first woman treaty commissioner. I am Nakaway, which is Soto or Anishinaabe, Irish, Scottish, and English descent. I am the first member of Kizikos First Nation to go to law school and practice law. And my experience spans federal, provincial, national, and territorial governments, indigenous and community-based organizations, which eventually brought me to where we are today at being the first woman treaty commissioner in Saskatchewan. Thank you, Miigwech. Thanks, Commissioner. Judy, did you uh, anything further you wanted to say in introducing yourself? Uh, I was born and raised in Cody First Nation, which is uh, around uh, Yorkton area in Saskatchewan and, and Treaty 4 territory. Um, I, I've been living in Saskatoon for now for 53 years, and I work with uh, a lot of uh, the vulnerable population, uh, work with them because of my lived experience of uh, being in residential school and uh, also uh, all those injustices that had happened and, and uh, to me. And uh, to give them strength, uh, I do sharing circles all over the city here, uh, uh, sometimes up to 12 in one week. And, and I work with uh, universities, all the institutes of higher learning, as well as the community-based organizations, some of, some of which are like the nonprofits and, and also the, the acute care centers uh, and uh, of course, uh, OTC, the city of Saskatoon and so on. And so that's the work I do. And I, and, I, and, I, and I feel that the creator put me on earth and keeps me healthy to keep doing the work I do. Miigwech, thank you. Thanks, Judy. Francisco, you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, I do. If I manage to unmute myself at some point. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, Oshin, Victor, John, and of course, Christian. Um, my name is Francisco Rudia. I am a Mexican man living in Canada. Um, my professional background, it's in peace building and violence prevention. So I've been working with um, peace building initiatives over the past approaching to 10 years now. Um, several levels of involvement with youth, uh, activists, um, federal, national and international stakeholders in many different processes. And now I work uh, here at the Office of Treaty Commissioner in Treaty 6 in Saskatchewan as the Truth and Reconciliation Process Coordinator. So I, I'm the one uh, working closely with different organizations at the provincial level to make sure that we help them understand where they're at in the reconciliation journeys and what they can do to take further steps in that process. 
Great. Thanks, Francisco. And just myself, my name again is Rhett Sangster, and um, I have a background in diplomacy. I worked uh, for 12 years for the Department of Foreign Affairs in, in Canada. I was posted in Turkey as a, as a political officer uh, for, two, for three years. Uh, I worked on our Afghanistan and Pakistan um, issues back in 2007 to 2009, back when sort of Canada was playing a big, big role in, in Afghanistan. And um, yeah, I became sort of really interested in conflict management and mediation. So I went back to school with a Rotary Peace Fellowship in 2012 and um, found myself back home where I grew up in, in Saskatchewan, uh, realizing that, um, you know, all the stuff that I was learning about in other parts of the world uh, applied to my own home country and uh, all the sort of issues of colonization and poverty and different things like that. Um, and wondered why, why would I work in another place when I could do humbly sort of the work that I could do in my own backyard. So that uh, found myself back in, in Saskatchewan in 2014. And um, yeah, nine years later here, I'm still working on this. So we wanted to talk a little bit about why reconciliation is even important. And so I know that well, often when you think about conflict, maybe you don't necessarily think about Canada right away. So, um, but we have, we have a lot of history here. And so, Commissioner, I was going to pass it to you to sort of give us a, a little bit about why, what is the context, Canadian context about this discussion around truth and reconciliation? <clears throat> Reminding us why about these conversations that are now happening with reconciliation and what the background is to it is um, more than just putting together this measurement and evaluation. Um, there's the historical context that this country was built on. <clears throat> um, that pretty much anything that was not inhabited by European settlers or explorers that now is, was an Indigenous country, it was Indigenous land. So where we are um, in the treaty territories, the treaties first began being entered into um, in 1871. These are the number of treaties during the Victorian era, Queen Victoria. Um, they were agreed to with the Imperial British Crown um, and it began the ceremony ceremony to Indigenous people are very sacred events. When you're having a ceremony and making a promise using a pipe, which is what they did when they created the treaty relationship, it was taking that promise and giving it to the creator with those parties. The parties being the crown, the other, the First Nations, and God, the creator. And that's the spirit and intent part that is very much almost absent from any crown perspective to date. So this kinship that was rooted in the world of indigenous treaty people being putting a sacred relationship to the creator, um, that's been far gone away from almost as soon as the treaties were began being negotiated and entered into. Um, we can see where the treaties led to, of course, the promises such as education, um, having the cunning of the white man so their Indigenous children would know the cunning of the white man and yet remember who they were, their culture, their identity. An education so their children would have the cunning of the white man and yet that education became residential schools, it became day schools. And we know today that these places, you know, their, their main intent were to be those vehicles of assimilation, of Christianization, uh, whether they were going to convert children from their indigenous languages and beliefs and make them throw away that identity so they would be Christian forms of themselves and themselves being the crown. And along with residential schools, day schools and industrial schools came abuse, sexual abuse um, by church officials, such as the churches who were running those institutions that they had become. So instead of getting a schoolhouse on every reserve, <clears throat> And a teacher, when we were ready to take our reserves after we signed treaty, we got residential schools. And we got over a hundred years of residential schools, generation after generation being told, if you don't believe in Christianity, if you don't believe in God, if you don't believe in how we pray and throw away who you are, you won't make it to heaven. That was instilled amongst our generations for over a hundred years. Today, we've had the Truth and Reconciliation Commission happen in this country. Um, that began in 2008, 
eight, I believe, was the apology from then Prime Minister Stephen Harper and the acknowledgement of what happened in residential schools. And there was an Indian residential school settlement agreement between the Assembly of First Nations, which was the national representative organization, and the Crown being Canada. In that settlement, it was agreed to compensation for sexual abuses, physical abuses on certain levels. It was to be a non-adversarial process, but it was still very difficult for survivors to relive the most heinous times of their life, the most terrifying times of their life, the most traumatizing times of their life. It didn't take into consideration at the time when that agreement was made about death. It didn't take into consideration forms of torture. And through the independent assessment process, which was taking survivors through this litigation type process, more and more stories came out about children being buried, about babies being thrown in incinerators. And just a few years ago, we know that with the discovery and the evidence of children's graves at Kamloops Indian Residential School, now the whole world believes us. They believe our ancestors, they believe our elders, they believe our survivors that genocide was committed. We have mass graves, <clears throat> sorry, I, we have unmarked graves that prove this. We have the jawbone of a child found in our own Treaty 4 territory, not far from where Treaty 4 was signed and entered into in 1874. And that was at uh, what was the Lorette Indian Residential School. And of course, from all these broken treaty promises, we have the education system and what it did to our people. We have missing and murdered Indigenous women, girls and boys. And today I'm in Treaty 1 territory in Winnipeg to participate in marches and rallies <clears throat> here because there's a serial killer in this city that was targeting First Nations women and dumping their bodies at the landfill. And they're having a very difficult time in retrieving the bodies that are in the landfill, even locating any ones that were other dumped. There was just another murder here and a remains found. So we're here to support our, our sister commission. We're here to show the people in these treaty territories that we're here to support them, that they deserve justice and that our women are not disposable. So from all these things that have happened in colonization, here we are as a treaty commission now in these times of truth and after the TRC, um, doing the work that we do. And as the first Indigenous Women Treaty Commissioner at our commission, <clears throat> I endeavor to try and make that relationship equitable. And when we have a completely inequitable relationship to begin with, then I have to lean on the side of the First Nations and the perspective there because that's the relationship that is inequitable. And it will continue to be that way unless we have allies and we have people such as myself in positions like these who realize where that inequity is and what we need to do to start addressing it. So the mandate of our office, we are a registered federal commission, but however, we are supposed to be independent and neutral. We are mandated by the Federation of Sovereign Indigenous Nations, which represents 74 First Nations across our treaty territories in what's now the province of Saskatchewan, and represented by the Government of Canada from the Crown Indigenous Relations and Northern Affairs um, Department. So in the federal government side, that would be Minister Miller of CERNAC. Um, our mission at first was to ensure that there was a common understanding of the treaties and the treaty relationship. So when this office was created in 1989, its first duty was to settle outstanding treaty land entitlement issues. From there, they determined they needed to keep a commission to advance education, to advance the spirit of negotiation, to educate using elders and elevating their voices about the spirit and intent of treaties before we lost that oral history. We advocate for strong treaty relationships through education, through advocacy between Indigenous and non-Indigenous citizens of these treaty territories that we are in. And through reconciliation, it is our mission to assist in returning to the true spirit and intent of treaty. Thanks, Commissioner. That's great.
so how when we talk about truth and reconciliation how does our office um understand that um from a peace building perspective i think we very much believe that uh in saskatchewan canada we have a negative peace uh, while there may be may not be bombs and and bullets flying um there are very much a lot of outstanding issues that haven't been dealt with and so we we're working towards try to build that more that positive peace where which is sustainable and and built based on a uh, a new relationship. So we've taken some of the definitions that are out internationally um, about, um, you know, this is about building a new relationship, one that has respect and understanding of each other's, of everyone's needs, fears, and aspirations. Um, we understand that truth and reconciliation is both a goal and a process that we're, we're aiming at. But we're also, um, again, we are trying to sort of uh, use two-eyed seeings approaches in terms of looking at things from both an Indigenous and a non-Indigenous perspective. And so we, um, we take the, some of the Cree terms, um, in this case, um, uh, pushed forward by um, Chief Willie Littlechild, who was one of the Truth and Reconciliation Commissioners, who talked about Truth and Reconciliation being uh, about Miwa um, which is a, means a lot of things. There's a lot of depth to that term, but uh, in part, it means about having a good relationship with each other, with the land, with ourselves. Um, and uh, another term that he talks about is we've panasun, which is about balance. And um, again, balance with ourselves, balance with each other, balance with nature, balance with uh, Mother Earth. So that's, um, those are kind of the things that we are, are using in terms of uh, defining reconciliation. We also use a lot the circle and um, learn from Indigenous teachings around the circle. And so uh, in all of our meetings, we work in the circle, and um, there's a lot of a lot of depth to that to that uh, worldview. And so we'd ask Judy um, if she could sort of give us a, a few minutes of of some of the indigenous teachings that she has um, around the circle. So Judy, if I'll pass it to you. Okay. Uh, so when we were uh, growing up as little children, already we were when when I, I remember we would be. Uh, our grandfathers, our, 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 uh, our uh, the older people would have, uh, you know, storytelling, for instance, it, we would always, whenever they came, and uh, one of them, I, I, I remember uh, my grandfather, uh, Roy Muspa, and uh, my, my uh, grandfathers, um, uh, John Pelly and, and George Brass. And whenever they came, they always had us sitting in a circle. The women always sat on one side or the little girls and the men on the other side. And there was all kinds of protocols. One of them was, was that all the girls were, were always uh, told not to not to be in that circle if you were on your moon time, which is uh, when you're menses, when you're menstruating because that was, uh, uh, women are very powerful at that time. And even as little girls, we were not to be close to the elders uh, uh, at that. And so, so very young already, we were asked to be sitting in these circles. We were, and then the, the old people would tell us stories. And, I'm, and this hasn't happened for many years, but I still remember them as a little girl. Uh, and then with, of course, with as, as time evolved that a lot of these things are being lost in our, in our um, as, as we go along. And now there's a big, uh, a lot of people taking land-based training and all, uh, there's, there's a survivor, not survivor, but uh, cultural camps all over, almost every reserve has them now, or every First Nation where, where they're trying to get back to these teachings. And almost everything that we did was circular because uh, in a circle, the circle, there's equality. And then, uh, and also, uh, uh, in lodges, everything is everything is round and everything. And then when you do your your um, circles or or when, when they do their ceremonies in a lodge, everything is done uh, clockwise as well, like uh, and usually starting from the east and all the way around. And and um, many of uh, the TP teachings are also uh, you know very similar with with uh, with with circles. So. In my, in my experience as a little girl, that's I, remember, I remember all those things. And all the time we would, we would uh, uh, all, the, all the lodges, the, 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 the Sundance Lodge, the Council Dance Lodge, the Sweat Lodges, they're all circular. And so, and, and then when we, sat, when we sat in there, it would be the same, the women on one side and the men on the other side. And uh, so, so 
the circle and as well as the, the four quadrants, the number four means a lot. And it's always very uh, uh, in tune with a, with a circle of the, the four um, stages of life, the four directions, the four elements, the four. So fours and circles always go <clears throat> hand in hand. And, and um, so, so in our ceremonies that, uh, uh, you know, that it's very important that, that, that we remember these things. And in my work, as I work in inner city Saskatoon and I'm working with a vulnerable population, I use, I use uh, uh, circles as well. Uh, in, in, in my, any kind of teachings I do, I always ask people to, to sit in a circle and, and uh, signifies the, the, how, how important it is that each person is equal. Like nobody, nobody is higher than the other. We're not sitting, sitting uh, you know, our ways of knowing are more uh, equality, more, uh, uh, there's nobody that's higher than the other. We're all equal. So when that, so the circle also signifies that. And when I do my circles with the inner city population, we, we, uh, we, everybody gets a chance to talk, you know, and then nobody's, nobody, nobody really is, is, uh, is uh, forced or, or coerced or anything to talk, you talk at your own leisure. But I always say that people need to, even just say uh, what you're thankful for. I teach gratitude and, and stuff like that. But I do, uh, uh, again, uh, it's, it, it spans everywhere in our lives. Uh, the teepees, uh, uh, the cycle of life, uh, 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 circle, uh, the, the uh, moon ceremonies, all the ceremonies are, are very circular. So uh, I guess, uh, that's that's a little part of it, and then again, I, I say it's very in tune with the four. Hello. Uh, Thanks, Judy. Okay. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, so Judy has talked about the circle and um, we're gonna do another little exercise here shortly, but I wanted to just very quickly um, talk about some of the strategies that we have in the Office of the Treaty Commissioner have been aiming at in terms of advancing truth and reconciliation. So using uh, again, some of the, the insights from the circle um, and the idea that we're all in this equally, that there is no hierarchy, uh, but that we, we need to come together. Um, we've been using sort of a collective impact model where we need, which says that we need to come together for a shared vision of what success looks like. And that if uh, we can all agree on sort of where the bus is driving, that, that you can do what you do best and I can do what I do best, but that we can move together and we can measure uh, together as well. So um, we've been working to build a measurement strategy to say, what is that shared measurement strategy for, for moving ahead? And how do we know if we're making progress to where we wanna to get to? Um, and then third, we've been actually going around and saying, who are the right people that need to do this work? So using our sort of uh, neutral um, facilitating power, our convening power to bring Indigenous and non-Indigenous folks together in the various regions of our province uh, to, to build relationships, to build trust, to learn together, to unlearn together. And so, um, so those three elements, figuring out what are, where it is we want to go, finding the right people, the community leaders that are the movers and shakers in the Indigenous and non-Indigenous community that probably don't know each other as well as they could, um, bringing them together for shared um, uh, uh, meaning making, and then saying, okay, how do we measure this together? So we've done this exercise that we're going to ask you to do, and uh, we've done it for people in Saskatchewan to determine what the future looks like. Uh, I'm not sure exactly where all of you guys are from, but I, I would invite you to uh, to think about this exercise from wherever you are working or wherever you are living or where you wherever you think that there is a conflict that needs to uh, benefit from truth and reconciliation. And if I would, if you wouldn't mind, um, we're going to ask you to close your eyes for just about three, four minutes. And uh, so get comfortable if you would. And I want you to um, close your eyes and imagine yourself 25 years from now. So do the math, it's 2023 and 25 years is 2048. Uh, how old are you? And think that through. 
So you can imagine yourself, maybe you're a little bit rounder, maybe you've got a little bit grayer, maybe, uh, but you're on, you're on the land and you're sitting around a campfire. You're, uh, you're at a place that is special to you. Um, and um, as one does around the campfire, uh, you start to tell stories. And you're sitting there around the campfire with some young people and you're telling them about how things have changed. How 25 years earlier in 2023, things were, were not good. Things weren't what they are today. But yet the 25 years later, uh, things have changed. Things have gotten better. So we're just gonna invite you to have take two or three minutes again to just sit in silence for a bit and uh, think about what is the story that you're telling that young person about what's changed. Um, and then second of all, what is the role that you played in that story? What was your own role? So if you wouldn't mind, we're just gonna sit in silence for two or three minutes, think about that. And then we'll, um, if you'd like, we can share some of your thoughts. But um, again, what, what's changed in 25 years and what was your own role? We'll come back in a couple of minutes. How are you guys? How's everyone doing? Does anybody want to share any of their thoughts, any of their story? Maybe you can talk about where you were, where that fire was and, and what, what the future was looking like in 25 years. Who wants to be the first I courageous? Can, I can start. Uh, uh, I, I, I was... Uh... My, my wish would be that uh, the languages are indigenous languages were not in, 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 in uh, you know, uh, they're not go going into extinction, extinctions. Like a lot of times people talk about how, how uh, we're losing our languages and they won't be any more language speakers. To me, language and culture uh, 
uh, go together. And in order to, for us to be recognized as, a, as, as nations, we have to have our language and culture and, to, and, and, and lots of immersion should be happening. And it already is, I think, in, in like, for instance, in Onion Lake, there's a whole immersion school there, people learning their languages and, and, um, and our sacred ceremonies. Are, if we don't keep our languages, we're not gonna have them anymore. So those things are very important. In 25 years, I hope that they're stronger than ever than, than they've ever been, that, that we continue to uh, encourage the, uh, our children to, to partake in, 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 in our sacred, sacred uh, teachings and our way of knowing. And land-based learning keeps, uh, uh, has kept happening. And now, now, now uh, there's a lot, of, lot more people that are doing the uh, food sovereignty and growing their own uh, a lot of their own uh, uh, food, like the, the, the vegetables and the fruits, and and that we have safe drinking water everywhere, and then and also that we we have no more missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls that we that we protect one another and 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 uh, and that's my hope for twenty five years. Miigwech. Thanks, Judy. That's great. So yeah, language and culture, ceremony. Uh, you touched on food sovereignty, clean water, um, violence against women. So yeah, there's lots of lots of great change there. Does anybody else want to share? There's no wrong answers. <clears throat> I'll I'll step out on a limb here. Thanks, John. Um, so I'm I'm John Balgley. Uh, I'm in, in what's now called Portland, Oregon, um, uh, land, land, uh, where I am now was, uh, originally occupied by the, um, Kalapuya and particularly, uh, I can't pronounce the name of Af Afalati. Um, <clears throat> um, anyway, so I, and, and so I, I would, um, hope that in, in 25 years, um, we here in in this area would have made some progress towards um, um, a truth and re reconciliation process. Uh, we're nowhere near that point now, but we are taking baby steps at least to educate people as to um, you know what happened to the uh, both the indigenous people who uh, lived in the area for uh, many many thousands of years. As well as the um, uh, black people who who live here now um, and have been uh, abused in, in in various ways, and we're now taking baby like I said now we're taking baby steps to educate people as to the um, uh, traumatic things that happened, and um, I think that that is a a good a good first step, and I hope that in twenty five years we will have you know, taking a lot of steps forward in that direction. Thanks, John. So yeah, you're talking about a lot about the history, about understanding the history and, and educating folks about what's happened on the, on your territory. That's yes, and and you know, making making changes to to um, uh, re re repair re repair the processes that are still happening today. Mm -hmm. uh, at least we should be able to to do that, even if we can't fix what happened in the past. Great, great. Thanks, John. Thanks for sharing. Anybody else wanna wanna share? We do have a few more minutes. Yes, I'm gonna mispronounce your name, Mutulolua. I'm sorry. All right. Hello, everyone. Hi. You tried. I'm with Lulua. Um, in the next 25 years, I'll reach Nigeria. I can look back and insecurity will have been a thing of the past. Some of the things ravaging us will have been a thing of the past. The Esmen crisis, the Boko Haram issue. All should have been a thing of the past and bad governance, bad leadership. So we are so that in the next 25 years, we now have more African leaders that are accountable to their people, that are selfless leaders, 
ready to transform Africa to be what is meant to be. And then the Africa will, the conflict in Africa will have reduced drastically. Thank you. Great, thank you very much, that's great. So security was for a big issue for you, for Boko Haram and, and things, uh, the different security issues in Nigeria will be a thing of the past. Uh, you talked about governance and leadership, you talked about accountability, um, and you talked about African leaderships and, and, and taking, taking that forward. So uh, thank you very much. Anybody else? I always joke that the three minutes, like of quiet, is the yeah. is the introverts' chance. So now this is stretch for the extroverts. If you want to now to Victor, yes, go ahead. I think yeah. Are you still there? We can't hear you, Victor. I don't know if you're. Internet is. Maybe we can come back to Victor. Anybody else? Uh, Kelsey or Ocean or Naji, Sarah? If not, that's fine too. We can move on, but it's Friday afternoon, so we're quiet maybe. I think I got hung up on the um, the portion of the question that asks about um, kind of what our roles will be in the change because I'm currently job searching. So while I know I want to use my peace building and mediation skills, um, where I will land and kind of what that will look like is very up in the air for me right now. So um, while I am in the San Francisco Bay Area and I hope that in 25 years we've um, addressed um, our um, massive challenge with um, the houseless community, just making sure that those folks are supported in the way that they would like to be supported. Um, I would love massive changes around um, anti-racism and, and more equity. Um, there are so many things that I would like to see change, but I think I've been quiet just because um, my own path in supporting that is um, still a bit unclear. I'm not sure it always gets that much clearer as time goes on either. So if that's any consolation for you, I'm still wondering what I'm going to be when I grow up too. So um, <laughs> weirdly comforting, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, yeah, uh, last chance. Anybody else want to? Sarah, you, you look like you had something you would like to share. Yeah, I, I can jump in. Um, no, thank you for leading this. And the exercise is very thought provoking. Um, I feel like when you ask that question, like what tugged on my heart is um, like my two references is like the conflict in Guatemala and having studied a lot of transitional justice. And so uh, I felt like the only way that that could make sense in my head was to be semi-aspirational, but it's also very hurtful to be so. And that is because the one thing that I wish for kind of truth and reconciliation is that people from different angles could sit down together to actually listen without kind of that emotion and instinct to jump in. And in the case of Canada and the United States regarding uh, Native American people's rights and whatnot, that has taken so long and it's still not fully there that folks can say, this is how I am and how it affects me. And it might be a very different reality than yours, but it is a reality. Um, I know, Sian, um, I'm deep in my career and I can tell you, I have no idea what I'm actually doing <laughs> other than sometimes editing Excel sheets to ensure people have funds. <laughs> like <laughs> That's important work. Uh, yeah, mm, important word. Yeah, but 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 it's it, I, I, at least I guess it's, it's moved things forward. Um, but I think more importantly, again, like I think I think of Central America and I think of the culture of silence and I think how intrinsic it has been 
to say that a country has moved away from its conflict when people are not talking about it and the, how that was very much the old school. And we just, that's just not possible. We've seen how much that gets politicized and whatnot, and it comes back and it comes back even if it's hundreds of years later, it always comes back. So I guess hope for 15 years that we can have that, that the fireside chat, uh, chat conversations, as you mentioned, are even a thing mm -hmm. for a larger population. That would be ideal. That's great. Thanks, Sarah. So really just even getting the conversation started is, is a challenge, is what you're, what you're saying. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's this is interesting because we've done this exercise in Canada many, many times, but this is the first time we've done this sort of with an international group. And so we weren't sure how, uh, you know, this exercise would work, but I, I do think um, there is a lot of commonality in terms of all, all these conflicts all over the world and, uh, and what we all want and, and, and what we all move forward on. So um, I'm just gonna, I'm gonna keep going. I think Victor came back. Uh, oh, did he? Okay. Yeah. Victor, did you want to add anything? Yeah, so sorry. Uh, I had an, uh, uh, issues with my... You can hear me now? Uh, you're you a little bit now? jumping in and out, but I think go for it. And we'll, we'll hopefully okay, try to hear you. you. Okay, you can hear me now? Yeah. Is, is it better now? It's good right. right now, yeah. So as I was, as I was saying, I said the issues of uh, morals. In fact, I'm trying to work with uh, an organization on how we can rebuild. I call it moral revolutions, moral revolution among the young generations. So that is a major source of concern for me right now, and uh, I look ahead to see how we can in the 25 years from now, revamp the moral standards of the Nigerian youth. Thank you. Okay, thanks, Victor. So moral moral standards in, in Nigeria is what you're, where you're speaking. We have one comment here, Ocean says, uh, from a peace building perspective as a field, I hope that in 25 years we've learned more from indigenous perspectives and knowledge around peace and peace building and also acknowledge where those learnings come from. Thank you. Yeah, I think that's a, I, I, I did a master's in international development policy from Duke in 2012 as part of the Rotary Fellowship and I'm struck now by how little there was on indigenous issues as part of that. Um, we don't I don't think in the peace fielding uh, scene talk a lot about indigenous issues, which is kind of crazy um, because it's the root, uh, the colonization is the root of a lot of these conflicts all, all over the world. Um, so anyway, I agree with you, Osian. That's great. Thank you. Uh, Abu Bakar, uh, I'm Abu Bakar Haruna Yusuf from Nigeria, a youth peace network member of community initiatives to promote peace and youth-led action researcher. I just want to say hi. Wish all everyone the very best. Thank you very much. Okay, we're going to move on just quick here um, on the rest of the presentation. So um, as I said, we've done this uh, hundreds of times now across uh, our province to sort of say, well, what is that common agenda? And so we took the answers similar to you, uh, what you said, and we pulled together this vision of the future that has four areas of work. And so the people of Saskatchewan, where we're from, um, have said that uh, we need to have four elements. And I think you'll probably see some of your own themes in there. But number one is that we need to have an understanding of our history. We need to know what has happened on this land, the past and the present wrongs. We also need to have a respectful relationship with our ancestors um, and a respectful relationship with the land as well. Um, we need to have uh, healing and uh, strength for our communities, for our nations, for our individuals, families. Out of that history, we need to start uh, working on that healing. So that's the first area, is uh, understanding of our history. Second of all, I think uh, Judy talked a lot about this, is the vibrant cultures and worldviews. So people have told us that we need to have Indigenous and non-Indigenous cultures that are vibrant, that are strong, that are celebrated, respected, and that are sharing space and learning from each other. 
um, and, and, and benefiting each other. So uh, that's the second piece. The third piece is that we need to look at our systems. I think there's a recognition that our education system, our uh, economic system, our political system, our health system, that they do not benefit everybody equally. And so how do we make sure that everyone has a quality of life? How do we reject racism? Uh, how do we look at uh, representative leadership? Um, and in a Saskatchewan perspective, looking at the treaty promises and Indigenous sovereignty, how do we honor that? So that's the third element of the vision. And then the fourth part is about relationships. And I think some of you guys touched up on this, even the, the element that uh, in Guatemala, we're not even at the dialogue stage without getting upset. And that our relate, I think that it really touches a lot on relationships. Um, and how do we get to a stage where we have trust and, and true partnerships and uh, relationships that can move us ahead? So those are the four areas of the vision that we created. And that's, uh, was the, we took a, it took us three, four years to develop this vision. And so every word in there has been talked about about 16 times. And, um, but it's, it's, we do find that people see themselves in it and it has worked fairly well. And so the next stage was to say, well, how will we measure that? Oh, sorry. The next stage was to say, how do we get the right people together? Francisco, I'll pass it to you. I'm gonna try to fly a little bit through the next slides because I think we're having great conversation before this. So now that we have a common idea of what is that the future might look like, how do we make that happen? Well, the second strategy is connecting the right people. How can we bring to the table the movers and shakers within different communities and within different organizations in the province and, uh, and get their input about how this vision can be achieved within their systems, within their structures, and hopefully within our society. Uh, so for that, the Office of the Treaty Commissioner has been working for many years with different communities around Saskatchewan, but also with different organizations. Uh, so this picture, we brought in together um, our 10 reconciliation circles into a big gathering where we dreamt together about what the future can hold for us if we start finding commonalities and finding a, a, a united path forward and start taking like a similar approach and similar action towards truth and reconciliation. Uh, can we move to the next one? And our third strategy, um, if we have any process geeks in, in the audience, welcome. Uh, this is my jam. But we have been thinking about how, how can we build a process that has some sort of data-driven approach so that we know how the impact that we're suggesting is being achieved or not, and what we, do we need to happen for make that happen. So based on key foundational documents, both legal and international documents, such as the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, um, the report of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission here in Canada, or the calls for justice on the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls inquiry, as well as the sustainable development goals, the United Nations declarations on the right of the children, as well as the UNDRIP. Um, we went line by line through all these documents and identified what things can be used as indicators to measure progress. So based on that, we created thousands of indicators. And those indicators then will compile into different models. So it started as a wall with a lot of sticky notes that then evolved into this very complex web of a logic model that was too complex to be useful to work on a daily basis, but gave us a very strong background understanding of what sort of leverage we need to move and pull and tweak so that we get the results that we want. And that in turn evolved into a growth model, which is a simplified version. And we use this to work with our partners across the province. So this growth model has, as you can see, as if it were vertical, uh, sorry, horizontal lines, you have the four different elements of the vision, the shared understanding of our history, vibrant cultures and worldviews, system that benefit us all, and authentic relationships. And to get to those, to that future in 25 years, there's a, there's a series of steps, and those are the columns, and are divided in three chunks, which are, um, changes that we need to do. First, we tackle capacity, the things that we need to change in the way that we know things. So how do we, how do we understand our history? How do we learn about different worldviews? How 
we acquire knowledge about systemic inequities and discrimination and bias and racism. Then we can move to the second, to the second uh, group of columns, which are behavioral changes. How we start tweaking the structures that we move in every day, our workplaces, our families, our small communities, our neighborhoods, what things do we need to do for those places to start changing. So for example, how do we use uh, trauma-informed approaches in our workplaces? How do we increase cultural safety for indigenous people in our communities and in the workplace? How do we engage meaningfully as treaty partners with indigenous communities? And then we move hopefully towards the last group of indicators, which are societal changes. How can we adapt then the systems that we live in, the health system, the justice and law enforcement system, the, um, the public policy and governance aspect of, of our nations so that they are compatible with this vision of success of truth and reconciliation where both indigenous people and non-indigenous people and of course new Canadians can feel that they belong in, in this place and we live in a space that is respectful, equitable and just for all. So now that we have that growth model, the, the big question is how do we use that? Um, how does it look like when working with different organizations and, and institutions? So Red's going to talk a little bit about how those indicators can help us steer change in a good way. Yeah, so just like some examples of so each of these outcomes uh, have a whole set of indicators behind them that can be looked at from an individual perspective. So I can use this model to me, Rhett Sangster, where am I at in my own reconciliation journey? I can look at it from my own organization, whether that's the Office of the Treaty Commissioner, where are we? I can look at it from my community, um, even from a sector. You, you could look at this from a justice sector or a health sector. But um, so for an ex one example um, under the outcome of understanding who we are and where we come from. So the percentage of governments, departments or organizations that are able to identify their own treaty history in Saskatchewan, how, how are they started? How did it come to be? Uh, how did that relate to indigenous people as they, as they were created? That would be one example. Uh, another one for an outcome on um, learning Indigenous spirituality, worldviews, and ways of knowing. So it could be the, the number of professionals completing updated First Nations and Métis cultural competency training per year over time. That would be something we could, we could measure and keep track of. Um, for the outcome of engaging meaningfully as treaty partners with communities in the land, which gets at some of the under, uh, elements of free prior informed consent. The number of government departments or organizations or businesses that integrate, integrate meaningful partnerships with First Nations and Métis in all decision-making processes would be one indicator that we could use. Um, so those are just some examples of some of the indicators that we have underlying that, that we then use to develop action plans for with organizations and pass that back to Francisco. So that brings us to our Truth and Reconciliation through Treaty Implementation Process, which is a very long name, um, so TRTI for short. So, what do we do? So right now, over the past few years, we've been engaging with different actors, mainly at the provincial and city level, to say, well, what have you done? What have you done in order to advance your journey? And what can you do from, from now onwards? So we have divided that process in two main phases. First, it's a facilitated process in which we get together with a group of champions with a certain organization and ask them, where they're at. What things have you done in the past, let's say five years to advance truth and reconciliation? So here we use a mixed approach between facilitation, focus group discussions, small group works, and an extensive data review process of documents they have, MOUs, partnership agreements, um, list of trainings, all that we can get access to, to then use all that data and sort of put it within our growth model so that we have a snapshot of how much you've done to advance a shared understanding of our history, or what are you doing to create systems that benefit us all, or how you're engaging with um, First Nations in a way that, uh, that we can get authentic relationships. So based on that survey analysis or, or based on that data analysis, we create recommendations for institutions. So we say, 
we identified 26 things that you need to do to ad advance your journey. And that concludes our first phase, the mapping. And then we move onwards, or we move on towards uh, implementation and measurement. So now that we know what we know, how we can implement a strategy that allows you to strengthen the things that you've already done and start implementing things that you need to do. Uh, and with that, we have developed a process in which we identify key strategic priorities, and then we use those priorities to identify how they can cope with or how they can um, fit with the recommendations that we have created. And based on that, we create a, an action plan for those organizations. And then we identify how we can measure. So we use the indicators that we have spoken previously as a way of knowing that in the future, these things can be uh, have a way of being measured as to whether the changes we're proposing are creating meaningful change or not. Um, so over the past few years, we've worked, as you can see in the logos, with the city of Saskatoon government. Right now, we are in the process of finishing our collaboration with the Law Society of Saskatchewan. And we've been working with the Saskatoon Police Service over a year. Um, no, over half a year. It's going to be a year in the fall. So it's been pretty excited. It's been pretty exciting to see firsthand how these institutions can have a whole journey of understanding and, you know, some very important aha moments. So it's been it's been truly a, an incredible experience to, to witness firsthand. That I think uh, sort of concludes our presentation on um, on our stuff. I guess what we would just like to ask you is, and I and we do have a smaller group, so we could we could sort of almost do a bit of a circle here. Um, yeah, I'll give everybody a chance. To, is there anything we'd love to hear from you? Um, is there anything you've seen that that we could learn from, or do you have any questions or any thoughts or critiques? Or we're we're open to, to ideas. So um, yeah, does anybody want to start? John, you look like you're ready to ready to say something. Couldn't find the button. <laughs> the button off the bottom of the screen. Uh, yeah. Uh, first of all, thank you. This was this was uh, for for me a great ending to this conference. Uh, it's full of practical advice. Uh, um, uh, I neglected to mention earlier that uh, although I'm I'm here under the sponsorship of the Never Again Coalition. Uh, in here in Portland, Oregon, uh, um, I do a lot of the work that this is most related to through my uh, synagogue, where we have a uh, committee working on racial justice issues, <clears throat> and we're um, um, overwhelmingly um, uh, white, <laughs> and um, uh, we're trying to figure out how to um, uh, make it make make more steps forward. And so this is a great a great been a great help um um yeah well that's a little that let me leave it that for the moment yeah great. thanks john thanks very much in my circle sarah you're next if you don't mind me calling on you um well thank you for calling on me i'm, I'm not sure that i can add much other than it's always interesting to learn and to hear from other experiences um given that every process of truth and reconciliation is completely different, they all kind of share a lot of similarities and there's always a human element. And so um, it sounds like in your guys' research, you've taken into account a lot of that human element, which I think you have to, to get anywhere with this. Uh, well, at the same time, I hear Francisco, I'm also a process person. So I love coming up with uh, with processes. Uh, but the thing about program management or process management is that it is the easiest thing in the world to do once you remove the human element. <laughs> in none of this, can you remove the human element? So, yeah. Thank yeah, you. things would be easier that way, wouldn't it? Thanks, Sarah. That's great. Uh, Victor, did you have any? Any final thoughts?
Victor, are you still there? Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, yes, I really, really want to thank you for such a, an enlightenment. It's quite an interesting one indeed. So I'm going to see what I can implement what I have learned here today. See how far we can run with it. It's quite meeting you all. Thank you so much. Mm. Thank you, Victor. Chris Chan, did you have anything to say? Been quiet, but here's your chance. No. Okay, maybe if he has something to add, we can ask uh, after is Ocean. Hope I'm saying your name right there. You are, thank you. Um, I was just thinking about, I also love systems and processes, Francisco, so um, I, I kind of lit up when you brought up that slide. Um, I was thinking about um, kind of what other groups this work could be shared with in terms of um, kind of creating more equity in the power dynamics of the, of the knowledge base, as the commissioner was mentioning earlier, that there's this kind of historic power imbalance. And um, I thought about that a lot in my um, graduate research. I was um, focused on trying to measure positive peace within corporations. I feel like they run so much. <laughs> um, and um, I ended up doing my research on um, benefit corporations and the B Lab B impact assessment as that as a measure of um, measuring positive peace. And so I'm curious if there are uh, benefit corporations that you could collaborate with. I know, interestingly, Danon is one of the largest corporations that's engaged in that process. And I wonder if um, one, if B Lab could learn from your work, because while their assessment is fairly comprehensive and kind of developing all the time, I don't know that it takes in um, this reconciliation and indigenous perspective so much. Um, and so maybe they have something to learn from you in order to develop their assessment. Um, and I also wonder if um, some of these businesses and corporations that are already trying to engage in doing this work um, might be partners in kind of engaging more deeply with your work directly. Yeah, that's good um, ideas. Thank you. And I think, yes, I think, for example, one of, one of the partners we're going to start working in the next um, few months is one of the operatives here in the province well, in, in Western Canada, uh, one of the biggest cooperatives in the country, if I'm not mistaken. So um, definitely we need, this, we need everyone on the boat for this to work. Uh, and that can never exclude the, the private sector, no, no matter how difficult it is at, at times, especially in the peace building, sector it's always like oh we need but we we do need all the hands on deck um because as you say they hold a lot of power and they create a lot of dynamics inside and out their doors so i do believe that that definitely we need to we need to reach out and we need to bring them to the table thanks francisco do you have anything last things to say francisco yourself um no it's just been great um to talk to all of you. Um, I've been traveling for a few years. Um, I did my first postgraduate studies in the UK and then I moved to Sweden and now I'm in Canada. So always um, getting back to a place where folks are from different places uh, lights my heart. So it's been great. Yeah, yeah, me too. Uh, yeah, I just maybe I'll just say but thank you very much to everybody. Um, it's great to, to talk to you all. And with that, because um, part of a uh, good moderator is to try to finish on time. So, uh, Judy, could you could you close us off in a good way, please? Okay. Once again, I'd like to thank you all for being with us today and, and uh, sharing all, all your uh, valuable knowledge to this group. And again, I will I will uh, uh, pray for you as after after this meeting is done in my traditional uh, way that I was I was brought up. And that you all have uh, safety in your families and that you get good karma and kindness for your work. And uh, with that, uh, thank you very much uh, to OTC for bringing us together and, and, let, and hopefully we can meet again in the near future. Thank you.
Thanks, Judy. Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of the day.